My text has already been quoted. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Two men looked out of prison bars. One saw mud and the other one saw stars. Difference in the direction. I will preach on tonight hills that help. What do you see tonight? I want to pray. Our Father, this is more than a man-sized task. And I pray that this night the message of the Lord will be spoken and received, heard and hearkened to. And Father, I'm convinced that what I'm going to preach is right. And I pray that it will help the people and that you'll pulverize souls and minds and give us a clear-cut divorce from the world. In the, the last message, we heard uh, Brother Hudson talking about the battle uh, with Satan and with the flesh. I pray now that the Holy Spirit may breathe on this great congregation. Bless Brother Box. Thank you for him and for all these preachers that are here. And may they have mercy now and be prayerful and save us from being critical. And if the truth and when the truth is preached, I pray it will find lodgment in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I request the right tonight and the privilege to preach since it's my 50th anniversary until I get through or give out. That's all I ask of you. I'm going to do it anyhow. <laughs> but I just want you to understand that if I ever intend to have any rank, I ought to start pulling it, and I'm going to do it tonight. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't intend to waste my time or yours while I'm preaching tonight. I want to call your attention to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew and we'll begin reading in chapter 21. No preacher has a right to be confused or wrong. And when you climb in the pulpit and introduce your message by saying, I may not be right, you're in the wrong place already. When you climb in the pulpit and said, folks, I've had so many problems, I'm confused, you're in the wrong place right there. The Bible said, whosoever believeth on the Lord shall not be confused. We need no uncertain notes coming from the pulpit today. There's enough sitting in the pew. And the one man that must be right is the preacher. And he can be right and know it without being egotistical, arrogant, or proud. Just simply say, the Lord told me what was right. Now you're listening? I was right 50 years ago, and my mama gave me that book. Now if I was right then, with this book, I'm right now. And if I changed books, I'd be wrong. And let me just announce to you right now, because there'll be people that'll be raising the question mark, don't ever tackle what you saw up here a while ago unless you got this book right here. I, haven't got, I wouldn't waste the time of day on you. I mean, those girls have been as low. They've been in psycho wards. They've been in shock treatments. Our boys have been in prison. Every one of them came to us in trouble, and this was the book that got them out of it. And before you criticize what I'm going to preach tonight, you just go out and start and bear the fruit that these children, these young people are bearing. You can't beat what this book has told. Chapter 21. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm, 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 I'm not confused, but I'm disturbed at what's happening in this country. I'm going to go back to the 1950s and the headwaters of the 1960s that, now we, everybody's talking about the new religion. The new religion, humanism. 
humanism. Well, I, you, may, you need to know tonight where humanism started. It didn't start in the world. It started in the church. That's where humanism came. It couldn't live if we hadn't built an atmosphere and a society could live in. Humanism came out of our religious school. The headwaters of the 60s. Let me read for you. In the 20th chapter, first of all, verse 18, Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Now then, that's Luke chapter 20 and verse 18. Now I'm going back to Matthew, give you some just about like that. Chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 27, and verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant or your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now verse chapter 21, verse 42. Did you never read in the Scriptures? Did you never read in the Scriptures? I heard Brother Curtis Hudson say a while ago that there seems to be an ignorance of the Word of God today. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now verse 44 again. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. America is in the powder mill tonight, and the powder mill was built because we got away from the Word of God. People have not just rejected the Word, they hate the Word. They fight the Word. They seek to destroy the Word. All right? Chapter 22 and verse 29. Ye do err, you make your errors, he said, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. And that's it. Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures. Now then, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Let's go to the first hill. What about the hill of Sinai? The lawyer went up there, didn't he? The leader, Moses. Amidst the thunder and the lightning came the first five books of the Bible. Moses was given by the Lord himself this book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. During the 1960s, the Beatles came, the mop tops, the dope. BBC came and filmed our work this year. And um, the newspaper came and wrote up a long story. Their conclusion was old-fashioned Victorian philosophy. That was their theme song. They said the girls have uniforms, the boys dress like gentlemen and look like they're in the military and so forth. They mind there's no problem with discipline in, in the schools. And they said, what do you think about that, Brother Olaf? I said, better than the Beatles you shipped over to us. You didn't help us when you shipped that bunch over here. Would you believe, and isn't it sad that 7,000, more than 7,000 rain-soaked, tear-soaked, Poor, misguided souls met on the fifth birthday of the death of Elvis Presley 
and stood in the rain to pay tribute to the man that killed so many young people, aborted their hopes, poisoned their minds. Over 7,000 stood in the rain to pay tribute to a man that was killed by his own rotten music and his own dope. In the 1960s, there was a mad Madeline Murray O'Hara that got loose and wound up in the Supreme Court and said to nine majestic magistrates, we get rid of the Bible. We don't need the Bible in the school. We don't want prayer in the school. And would you believe they'd listen to a woman like that? And since then, we've had nothing but violence, bloodshed, rebellion, danger, teacher strikes, and name it, in the public school. I was down at Bob Jones University when we had that um, uh, conference on uh, advocates in adversity. Now that just means we're all in trouble is what that means. And incidentally, they're not incidentally, they're in trouble. On October the 12th, they're going before the Supreme Court. And let me, let me get something off my chest now. What about this IRS business anyhow? You mean if the IRS takes our exemption away from us, we're going to all quit and fold up? And, well, man, we was in business before that new kid ever got on the street. Let me say something else. Preacher, if your church can run you off, you ought to be run off. If you haven't got about hope in that, you better just take off now. And if the IRS can, can stop us and can stop a ministry like, as missionary as this, let them have at it. Folks, we don't belong to the DHR. That's the Department of Human Resources. We belong to the Department of Divine Resources. That's what the Bible, Christ is the head of this whole thing. Holy Spirit's the administrator, and the King James Version is our rules and regulations. I see a couple of Johns out there tonight. John Pierce and John Robertson. Boy, if they're not a team. You know, it's been refreshing to know them just to meet somebody that's in the radio ministry that's honest, especially two in one wad. I mean, they're great boys. Stand up, Johns, both of you. Sitting by your mama tonight, and I know you had to behave. Brother, I appreciate your being honest and showing such tremendous interest in the ministries that we have. God bless you. You may be seated. Folk, I'm trying to say something tonight, and that is, when we get away from this book, when we get away from that hill, now I know there was trouble brewing. Brother, when, when Moses came down and God said... You better get down there. There's something going on wrong. And Joshua said, no, there's a war in the camp. And uh, they walked into the camp, and they saw the first nudist Connolly. That's right. Sin, false religion, golden calf, worldly associate pastor. There it is. Let me once again, let me once again, Raise the question, what did Moses do? Had arm load of the Word of God. Load the first five books of the Bible. And um, he dropped the tables of stone and they were broken. After he'd fasted 40 days and 40 nights and God gave him. You know, that might be a good way uh, to stop a lot of these people from rewriting the Bible. Make them for fast 40 days and 40 nights before they write. Boy, that cut down on the new revisers. <laughs> what did he do? He stood in the camp and said, who's on the Lord's side? He was one of these fellows. I reckon other preachers are gone and know how to draw a line, holler, get over here, I'll kill you. <laughs> he didn't stand there like a wet noodle from Jello Seminary uh, with a little tapioca devotional and said, Something good's going to happen to you. No. 
Brother, he had the conviction of the Word of God. Though it may be laying in the dirt, he had enough in his heart to say, Who's on the Lord's side? Get over here! And those that didn't, he killed every one of them. That sounds like capital punishment. <laughs> Brother, since last I met with you, we've had a lot of things to happen in this country. Strange and horrible things are happening that you cannot believe that are happening. And so there came uh, the Word of God. Now, the question seems to be raised today. God gave His Word, but somehow or another He lost the power to protect it and to keep it. And so every time Dick and Harry came along and said, I believe I'll rewrite it. That's where humanism started, right? That built the atmosphere and that tore up some things in this country when people began to say, well, we'll just rewrite it. We'll make it sound better, easier to read. Let me give you some things here. I didn't bring this. I didn't know I had it, but I saw it in my briefcase a while ago, so here it is. I'm glad I got it. I'm glad I got it. Now, the King James Bible is clarified. It took 130 to do it. it took $4,500,000 to pay for it. Now, this, and, and Sam Moore is my friend. He's been to see me. I love him. But let me tell you something. Love don't have a thing to do with my conviction. Now, you put that down. You'd say, well, I'm going to get married. Help yourself. But I want to show you some things. There's no use for people to read the King James or any other Bible if they can't understand it, says Mr. Samuel, President Thomas Nelson Publishers of Nashville, which turned out the refurbished version. Called the New King James Version, it clears away the often befuddling, obsolete usages and make the great old work currently comprehensible without losing the literary grandeur. In a matter of time, you get this. In a matter of time, the King James Version was going to be deserted if it was not updated, says scholar Arthur Forst out of Dallas, who headed the New Testament team for reworking. That heritage should not be lost. It's great literature. It's more than that. It's the Word of God. Yeah. Brother, I've never found any need on earth that this Bible wouldn't meet, and you haven't either. And I'm just simply saying, some of these things we don't need. Why, he said, notice, he said, it is published by the same company that publishes the Revised Standard Version of 1952, which has been broadly approved by most major Protestant and Eastern Orthodox denominations and Roman Catholicism of virtual common Bible. Not with me! Now here's your Reader's Digest. They got just as much right and probably just as qualified to rewrite and butcher the Bible as Mr. Hinckley. I know it's endorsed by George Weber, New York Theological Seminary, Norman Vincent Peel, Oral Roberts, Duke K. McCall, David Hatt, Orville Freeman, Donald Shriver, Brian M. Kirkland. You know what he said? Mr. Duke McCall, a creative, new, and effective approach. At a time when the Bible is still the unread bestseller in the land, I welcome this newest effort to entice people to read what God has said. You know, Norman Vincent Peale said, the Reader's Digest is to be congratulated for bringing the book on which our country was founded to the attention of the population in this reverently innovative manner. If that, hear me now, if that illegitimate child of a prostitute, and that's what it is, 
Had it been on the Mayflower, it had never made it over here. You want my illustration? Here it comes. I weighed 80 pounds for three years. Looked like I'd never get any bigger. But suppose somebody knocked on my door. Mama said, Lester, Sonny boy, you better run to the door. Somebody's knocking. I go to the door. And I said, come on in. And a great big bruising looking sort of a fellow walks in with a big butcher knife. I said, bud, what you have on your mind? <laughs> Eighty pounds. He said, I want to see your mother. And I said, yes, sir. I'll be standing between you and my mother as long as you've got that butcher knife. I said, what do you got on your mind? And my sweet, wonderful, simple, precious mother said, Sonny boy, what does he want? I said, I don't know if he can tell us. He said, Lester, is that your name? I said, yes, sir, Lester Leo. That's it. I still don't know what you're doing that butcher knife. He said, son, I've come to cut away a bunch of your mother. There's too much of her. She's a little cumbersome. I'm going to cut off her left arm, her right leg, her left ear flap, and I'm going to cut out her right eye. Hmm. Boy, can you see this freckle face, boy? I said, man, you'll be lucky to get out of here alive. Listen, I'd climb up to his neck as fast as I could get there and choke him till I stopped him from breathing. Now, have you, are you catching on now? Then why don't you preachers do something about it? Don't you realize they're butchering our mother being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And I'm telling you, don't monkey with my mama. I'll fight you about it. I'm mad. There's never been a revival come out of the Revised Standard Version. Good news for modern men, living Bible for dead people. Never been anything good come out of them. You'd say, well, it's because you haven't been educated. I don't want no more education than I got now if I have to get like that. About? I've been to school 19 years of my life, but I'm glad I went to school when there wasn't nothing but this. I can remember the time when the old preacher said, let's all stand and read in unison. Try it now. <laughs> Folks, the old preacher was preaching that when they got saved. The old preacher was preaching that when God laid his hand on my little old ignorant soul and told me to preach. I mean, that book is the source of everything good I've ever known in my life. You know, I had, I never dreamed, but Mr. Walter Mingdon called me to Austin the other day for a 600-seat banquet at the Marriott and the inauguration or the installation of Governor for the day. He said, Brother Olaf, will you bring that old book? I want to be sworn in with the book that you fought through the battle and won. That old Bible climbed up in the big place there and he took that Bible. And said, Brother, this old book will see you through. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that cometh out of the mouth. Listen, the helpers hill, Aaron and her, on top of the hill. Did you know Moses was the lawyer, powerful, wonderful man, leader of the greatest group of people any man have ever lived and had a tremendous career, and yet he got tired and weary. And he had Aaron's and hers to hold up his hand. I believe if preachers' hands would hold up toward God today, I believe the enemy, the Amaleks and the Amalekites, would be defeated. 
Fifty years ago, the Lord laid his hand on me to call me to preach. And uh, what about the next hill? I'm hurrying to get through some of them. Elijah, God's prophet. Now, we got through with the lawyer. Here goes the prophet. He's been hid away now for about um, three years and a half, 40, 42 months, and he cut off all the water faucets, and um, God said, you better go hide, and he did. And um, he came out and, of course, was full of the miraculous power of the Lord. And nobody ever stays alone with the Lord without getting about a lot of the Lord in him. And the nearest thing I've got to getting with Jesus is this book right here. That's my entire library right there. I'm too old to fool with anything else. I got too many burdens. I couldn't make it without this book right here. Memorize this book, brother. Met on Carmel for the contest. Bought 450 to 1. He let the ministerial alliance go first. The whole ecumenical movement was present. They were organized, properly robed. But they did not get one spark of fire from heaven. They cut themselves in blood, gush. They were sincere, but they were wrong. Elijah said, step aside. Give me 12 barrels of water. Brother, he's fixing to get up steam. <laughs> and it takes two things to get up steam, and that's water and fire. That means this book and the Holy Spirit. You get loaded with it, you'll come out with steam. Then Elijah, under the threat of a woman, head of the ERA. There's nothing new under the sun. And God required that which is past. You know, Dr. Robertson, I started off with Billy Graham. I've been with him. I've prayed with him. I've seen him fall on his face and weep. I've heard him call the communist vipers and snakes. But there's been a change. Folks, when you begin to hobnob with the compromisers and the religious leaders, you're going to be in trouble. I'm concerned not just about the fundamentalists. I'm looking for a bunch of fundamental fundamentalists. I mean that. I can see a trend that's altogether unhealthy in this country. First of all, I see immorality, marriage and divorce being forgotten. I see some things happening in our country among our people that's not good. Have you been to Mount Moriah? You know, many years ago when you had a revival, people used to talk about putting Isaac on the altar. You ever thought about that? God said, Abraham, what a blessing Abraham has been. I found that a hundred and some odd times God talks about Abraham. Think about that. I mean, the book's full of Abraham. You know why? Friend of God and father of faith. God liked to talk about him. I mean, he and God ran together. I mean, they were close companions. And God talked about his friend like that. Friend of God. Father of the faithful. But he hung and clung to the promise. You remember that? The Bible said he didn't stagger the promise. The unbelief was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being persuaded what God promised is able to perform. And he stayed with one thing, and that's the promise. Not promises, one promise. Brother Clyde, God said to Abraham, Get out! That's what he told him. First thing he told him, he said, Get out! He said, Where do you want me to go? He said, That's none of your business. Get out. 
Wouldn't it be a fine thing if all of us realized it's none of our business or none of your business what you preach or anybody else? But that's God's business. Get out! And he got out, went to a country God showed him, and took Lot along. Lot uh, pitched his tent toward Sodom, dwelt in Sodom, and uh, the old king came and captured him and 318 uh, good soldiers that he trained, home trained soldiers. Abraham, uh, they could have said like a lot of these folks today, Brother Olaf, you fight, I'll pray. No, let's fight together here. Folks, I got enough awards and trophies and plaques to fill a pickup truck. But they don't help build buildings. You get as old as I am, you realize that you got to get with it if you're going to get anything done. I know time to waste. And where there's no vision, the people perish. And I reserve the right tonight when I'm through this message to talk to all the people that are here for just a few moments and share a burden with you that we have down in Texas that I think is very precious. Isaac was laid on the altar. Why, that's his hope. Isaac and his father. You notice Sarah didn't go. Sarah stayed home. The servants didn't go. And little Isaac said, My father? He said, Yes, son. He said, I'm here. He said, What do you want? He said, uh, Here's the fire. Here's the wood. Where's the lamb? Got to be a lamb. He said, uh, Son, my God will provide himself a lamb. But Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up from the dead, which he also received as he received him in the figure. Folks, Abraham, faith doesn't argue with God. Faith doesn't talk back. Faith believes. It's not recorded, but I think uh, um, maybe little Isaac could have said, uh, Father, he said, yes, son. That butcher and I was getting awful close. He said, Dad, is this uh, curtains for me? Well, he said, if it is, uh, God will raise you up. He said, son, don't forget I was 100 years old when you got born. Me and your mama both were plumb dead. And if he could raise both of us up, he can raise our boy up. That's faith, isn't it? Ah, hear me tonight, dear friend. The counting of God was able to keep the promise. And he did. Let's hasten. One of my favorite hills is Transfiguration Hill. Jesus said, Peter, James, and John, let's climb a mountain. He said, fine. They went up there, looked up a couple of astronauts coming down. You know who they are? Moses and Elijah. There comes the lawyer. There comes the preacher. There they are. You don't get rid of people like that too easy. They may show up any time. Space don't bother them, and they weren't in a space capsule either. Didn't have an oxygen bottle. They landed, and they were talking to the lawyer. Maybe had his little briefcase. <laughs> he said, uh, Jesus, he said, yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Attorney. He said, um, I represent all the people that have gone to heaven on a promissory note. And he said, uh, they've sent me to represent them. And I want to know if you're on your way to Calvary. I want to just kind of take them some good news back. Jesus smiled and said, I'll soon be there. Go back and tell them the note will be paid. Amen. Oh, yeah. And I think Elijah hollered, Amen. Praise the Lord. Maybe preached a message as long as Bob Gray. But there they go. What a wonderful encouragement in the lives of those precious people. Transfiguration. Then we come to that hated hill, 
when humanism had its heyday and um, what they thought was their greatest victory. Yes, Golgotha's hill, Gethsemane connected with it, where Jesus fought his battle of Armageddon. You know, the modernists would make you believe that Jesus had a hard time going to Calvary. And they'd make you believe that he was in doubt as to whether he'd ever get up. No, no. The fact is, I think he nearly had to insult old Pilate to get him crucified. I think Jesus' attitude, let's get on with it. And Jesus, when sin was at its worst, grace at its best, and Jesus gave his life on Calvary. But that's not all. Have you ever thought about who killed Jesus? Have you ever thought about how Moses died? You said that Moses never did die. Oh, yeah, he died. He died twice. Boy, that's one more than he's supposed to. That shows you how people hate the law. I mean, the right kind of law. I mean, uh, Moses, you know, uh, God said to him one day, Would you like to go up on uh, Pisgah's lofty height? View you home and take your flight? And he said, I might as well. He said, do you feel like walking? He said, feel like walking. I'm not but 120. Why, I guess I do. And they climbed on the top of the hill, looked over in the promised land, and the uh, Bible said um, he died according to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. What else? He died according to the word of the Lord. Wasn't that it? He ought to know that. He said, Lord, is this really my swan song I'm singing up here? Is it all over? He said, sure, you're going to have to die. He said, how? I feel too good to die. He said, I just climbed that hill and I'm not even out of breath. I'm in good shape. Well, he said, I can take care of it. You're going to die the way you live. Are you listening? I'm going to let you die by the word that you live by. And that's it. Folks, why is it necessary for us to have to look forward to sickness killing us? Why couldn't the Lord just go ahead and say, you've had it? I think, I think the Lord just said, uh, Moses, would you like to die happy? He said, yes, sir. How would you like to die? He said, I'd, I'd like to die listening to you talk. He said, okay, die. <laughs> He's over. <laughs> he died happy. He died with a smile. And, and, and I think the Lord caught him before he hit the ground. That's what the book said. He died according to the, his natural force was not abated. His eye was not dim. Jesus died on Calvary. You remember old Pilate said one day, hey, don't you realize I got your life in my hand? He said, no, you don't. No, you don't. Your whole army couldn't kill me. I mean, he didn't say it, but I mean, I could say it for him. Your whole army couldn't even break my little finger, save their life. Now, he said, if you want to know, if you really want to know who's to blame, I mean, if somebody's committing sin by killing me, you better talk to my father because he sent me to die and I came to die and I'm going to die. Now let me get on out there. Folks, Jesus' trip to Calvary was no accident. No, sir. Well planned before the foundation of the world. And so, on the cross, hey, I got something fresh for you. He said, John... Behold your mother. Take care of your mother. You know when I read that, what I think? Behold my Bible. The last, when the last thing Jesus did was to take care of his mother. And the last thing I intend to do is take care of my Bible. And that's it. And by their fruits, you're going to know them.
There will be two end time battles among fundamentalists. Now, you know that the Catholics have been gone a long time, and the, I mean the Episcopalians and Methodists and Presbyterians and Southern Baptists. I mean, it's all over with them. I mean, they couldn't even mock a preacher. I mean, you know that. Nazarenes, Assembly of God. I can't imagine. And dear friend, I don't mind saying it. I knew Oral Roberts when he preached. See, I don't have the time, but there came a time in my ministry when I got sick of Baptist religion, promotion, organization. I said, Lord, if Enoch walked with God, why can't I? I mean, if, any, uh, if other people live by faith, why can't I? Now, in order to get the, the, for the Lord to get you to do it, He won't tell you the outcome. He won't tell you where you're going. He just said, take off. Folks, isn't it strange to see people today that have drifted away from the anchor of this old blessed book? They don't have the joy of salvation. They don't have any songs in the night, not even in the light. Show me a man that's not in love with this book. I'll show you a man that doesn't have the power and the joy and the glory of God on him. I don't care who you are and how many degrees you got. God will risk his power and no life unless it's saturated with this book. That hated hill. You say, who killed Jesus? The soldiers didn't. Jesus had to kill himself. Had to. After all, if he laid down his life, he had to lay it down, didn't he? You think he said to a Roman soldier, would you do me a favor? He said, yeah. I'm you, what do you want me to do, kill you? And he said, yeah, will you please kill uh -uh. I think he gave every drop of his blood. And when all of his life ran out, he still wasn't dead. Jesus had to die the same way Moses died, according to the word of the Lord, and he was the word. I heard Brother Curtis Hudson talking about Jesus in the wilderness with the devil. And I believe he took the same word that I've got tonight and defeated the devil. And there's no other way to win apart from that. And as I close this message tonight, dear friend, I'd like to remind you of these same two blessed witnesses. I read it this afternoon, 11th chapter book of Revelation, when they were witnessing on the street. They were street preachers. You remember that? Same old two. There they are, walking up down the street. And here comes your television cameras. Folks, did you know that 43 years ago, when the three sewer lines were introduced, ABC, NBC, and CBS, and that has completely demoralized America. I have enough clippings written by them themselves saying there's not one, you think of this, there's not one show, that's what they said, on television today that's said in the present and that's not science fiction that presents a woman with young children who's married, secure, and happy, not one. That's what they said. America has gone down the drain with new Bibles and new entertainment and immorality. And I said to you last year when I was here that three things that's happened. Licensed liquor. My city of Corpus Christi has just killed 30 people and 25 of them were full of liquor. They died because of liquor. 25 out of 30. And yet where's the people that vote that filth out again? Never. Too wicked. America's a drunkard nation. Number two, she's committed the abortion sin. Just like Pharaoh, we, we got to go to the river of destruction. America will not be spared. We're too far gone. Judgment has set in. 
And then number three, the sodomites are taking this country over. They operate Houston, Texas, the mayor and the rest of them. And they had 37 deaths and murders one week in Houston, Texas. 37. But have you ever read that verse that said the wages of sin is what? All right. Does that explain why 20 million herpes victims are rotting with no remedy tonight? No hope! No way! And yet, would you believe this report right here? I cannot believe this to save my life. I saw it this afternoon. Here it is. This is from Mr. Robert Weinreb, Executive Director, National Herpes Research Foundation, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Notice, he said that uh, herpes victims do not have to withdraw sexually. In other words, just go ahead and die and stay with your sin. And then here's your remedy right here. We favor rational education and expanded research effort as the best ways to fight herpes. You know what I recommend? The new birth. It's sin! And America is rotten to the core tonight. Now then, the closing thought I want to give you. When these two witnesses, they were killed, weren't they? They were killed in the street. These blessed old saints of God. There goes the law. And there goes the preacher. There goes the outstanding preacher. And the outstanding lawyer. And they're dead. And the television camera comes and... Well, they're dead! And announced it and flashed it around the world. Second day... Still dead. Nobody. Wasn't in the funeral home wanted them. Wasn't anybody wanted to bury him. Third day. The camera. Mm. Man, they're moving. And I see him drop his camera and head. Folks, God's power was with those men. You can't keep God's people killed. Abel being dead, yet speaking. Folks, have you really trusted the Lord and laid your Isaac on the altar and said, Lord, all that I am and have, I surrender to Jesus. I'm concerned about our Baptist people getting away from the book. Fifty years ago, the Lord called me into His ministry and gave me the right book. And I've seen its fruits. And I've never seen this book defeated. I've never seen a sinner too hard for it to save. A prostitute too dirty to purify. A drunkard too hard to sober. A dopehead too difficult to deliver. This book right here. And I ask you tonight to renew. You students, stay with the book. Let me give you my advice. Memorize one chapter every 30 days. My two choirs are coming quickly, please. Memorize a chapter every 30 days. Sleep with it. Eat it. Live with it. I'd have never made it through the eight years of the battle if it had not been for this book. I could not live today Wait, not for this book. There are two years that I faced, the most difficult two years of my life, my first one and my 50th one. I've never known a year like this year, not in my life. I've never known the heartaches, the burdens, the tears, uh, the heaviness, the battle. Night before last, I was um, in a motel room and I had a visitor at 2 o'clock in the morning. And that's not strange. He didn't knock. 
The safety latch was on. It didn't bother him. He came right in. He said, you've gotten all the sleep you'll get tonight. I'd been in a bed two hours. And my only way for any sort, I mean, actually, I've never in my life had such pressure as I've had this year. And I took this book, and I, I began to quote chapter after chapter, verse after verse. And I want to share with you, just before we close, I want to share with you Psalm 55. In the most difficult time I've ever known in my life, the Lord gave me when I spent two nights on the floor in um, Arizona and in Florida. As for me, I'll call upon God. The Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. Second Corinthians chapter 1. We should mark. You're going to need this someday. How precious and sweet. And listen, you'll never believe much more of the Bible than you experience. And you'll never believe the Bible without having the experience it someday. We would not have you, brethren, ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. We should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us, here we go, from so great a death, doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Did you read the story of the paraplegic wanted to learn to fly? With one hand, no legs except dead legs, one crippled arm, he said, I want to fly the instructor said, you have to get in the plane by yourself. He climbed in that plane, little old single-engine plane, with one hand left the bloody trail behind, got every rating he could get. He wanted to fly. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as an eagle. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Thou my everlasting more than friend or life to me all along my pilgrim journey Savior let me walk with thee close to thee Amen close to thee close to thee, those to thee, all along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let 